Okay, class, in this section, we'll get into exercise testing for heart failure. So uh, probably one of the more common tests that you'll see used to assess exercise capacity in patients with heart failure is a six-minute walk test. It's used extensively in heart failure research studies. It's used extensively in, in clinical practice. Um, it's super e easy to utilize. Um, we have some great uh, cutoffs. I'm not sure why I have this two here. Let's cut, let's cut that off. Um, that if patients get below 300 meters distance um, covered, um, it's you know, associated with a higher uh, mortality and morbidity um, with a minimally critical important uh, change or difference of 30 meters. Um, and there's just some basics on setting up our course. And again, just a quick review of our, um, of our length here. Um, and we'll cover this more in lab, but just a reminder that we want the course to be at least 100 feet or 30 meters um, and they're you know, to walk around the cone each time. Um, and the shorter the course, right, the more turns they have to take. So it's going to artificially lower their level um, or score. So we really want to be cognizant of trying to use a standardized uh, course. And we'll, we'll cover that more in lab. Now, there are also uh, shuttle walk tests. So this is very analogous to the the yo-yo test or the beep test, but it's basically the same concept using walking and a shorter distance. So uh, with this course, um, the patient uh, walks around um, or really between two, two markers that are nine meters apart. So we have 10 meters of distance total, and then they're inlaid about half a meter in. And then uh, they walk you know, between these, these two to intervals um, to an auditory signal. Uh, so unlike the six-minute walk test, which is self-paced, this is externally paced using an audio recording that you know, they make one beep and they have to get to the other end by the second beep, just like the, the beep test or the yo-yo test for my uh, fellow former soccer players or rugby players out there, or lacrosse. I think lacrosse does it too. Um, this is a common test used in heart failure as well, it's becoming increasingly common. You need less space, uh, but I believe the recording is proprietary, so uh, that, that is one limitation to it. And then you stop until they can't uh, make it to the next cone um, you know, uh, prior to the beeping sound, and you measure that level for exercise capacity. Um, but I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about the value of cardiopulmonary exercise testing for heart failure. Uh, this is really viewed as the gold standard um, because you get a lot of data from a cardiopulmonary exercise test that you just don't get from a six-minute walk test. Six-minute walk test will get, you know, we can get average walking speed. We can get total distance, which is strongly associated with mortality and morbidity and outcomes. But uh, if we want to assess exercise capacity, we should assess, you know, you know if, we, if we want to really assess VO2, assess mandatory responses to exercise, blood pressure responses to exercise, we, we got to do, you know, you know, do a test that does that, and that's what a cardiopulmonary exercise test does. And the value is um, that you know, there are there are values beyond just VO2 that are important for heart failure, um, most notably the VE, VCO2 slope that we talked about in, in health promotion, fitness management, um, that basically if you have a higher slope, meaning that you need more ventilation, right, to move a unit of a carbon dioxide out, um, there's some sort of inefficiency if you're breathing, right? So we're finding that in heart failure, if anyone really goes above a 30 of that slope, right, their slope's a little bit more exaggerated um, from normal, where they need more ventilation, they need to breathe more, right, to move the same amount of carbon dioxide out, that, that, that reflects a poor or poorer prognosis. And the great thing about this is that we can ascertain this even from, um, you know, you know, people who aren't able to get the true a true VO2 max. So there's a, a strong value in, in VEVCO2 slope, and you can't really assess that um, from a six minute walk test. You have to do a cardiopulmonary exercise test. This is an example of then just to the, the differences between severity. So if we look at, you know, a healthy person, a slope of about 19, fairly normal, and then mild heart failure again above 30, and the worse or off you get, Right, the more ventilation, more breathing you have to do to move the same amount of, of, of CO2. So it's just to the left in, in heart failure, this VEV CO2 slope. So the higher the slope, the more the steeper the slope, the worse the prognosis. And again, <clears throat> there's just you know different graphs here from a, a study by Pecora demonstrating this, right? The stepwise relationship, one between VO2 
strongly associated with you know long term mortality. And again, the, the the lower someone's fitness is, um, the worse off they are. The problem is most patients with heart failure may not even be able to do the eight to twelve minutes that you really need on an exercise test uh, to get. You know, reliable VO2 data, uh, but VE V is to slope, right? We can look at that um, early in exercise um, for measuring expired gases. So um, the other is that we also see this clinical manifestation of, of oscillatory ventilation, where we see this these oscillations in breathing, um, at least three or more, um, these fluctuations in the breathing pattern during exercise, um, which has an amplitude greater than 15% of the basal amplitude, and it persists for about 60% of the duration of the test. Now, um, normally when we exercise, we talk about that linear you know, rise, and it gets a little bit hyperbolic near the end, exponential, but it still follows a pretty similar, pretty smooth trend line as we exercise in a normal person as, as we continue to work out harder on an exercise test. In patients with heart failure, um, there's other causes of this, but heart failure is where we see this most often. They demonstrate this almost chain Stokes-like breathing pattern where they have these peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys, uh, which is not normal, right? Um, we, this, this waxing and waning of ventilation of, of faster breathing, slower breathing, and associated with changes in, in both PaCO2 um, and, uh, and PO2 as well. So P should be PaO2 and PaCO2. Um, and now this is... Uh, not normal because one, like both should both stay fairly stable during exercise. Arterial oxygen concentration and even CO2 shouldn't change much, uh, except that at the end when PeCO2 actually starts to decrease, but should stay pretty consistent for most people. And we think this has to do with this, um, you know, abnormalities in ventilatory drive, which will then affect PaCO2, the slow breathing, then the PaCO2 increases. So we see these, these fluctuations between uh, blood gases corresponding to the changes in ventilatory drive. And we really only see this in patients with heart failure because we think it has to do with the um, uh, issues with, with ventilatory efficiency even at rest. And then we impose a stress of exercise. We see the, this, this, this funky oscillatory breathing pattern um, in these patients. Um, we often think chemoreceptor drive may also play a role here. So this oscillatory ventilation. And the presence of this is, is a very, very, very strong prognosis for um, poor outcomes, right? If someone demonstrates this EOV or oscillatory ventilation during exercises, again, almost chain stokes like breathing um, driven by changes in, in blood gases that should not happen. And then we can also, um, you know, this is work by uh, Guazzi, he's an Italian cardiologist in, in arena, uh, to look at, you know, classifying patients not only just by VO2, but by these different ventilatory um, markers. And giving us a much more robust um, prognostic tool for heart failure beyond just looking at um, VO2. And, and it's, it obviously goes even beyond a six minute walk test. So, the reason why I bring this up is if you work in heart failure populations, um, obviously th there's a lot more additional training that you have to go under to, you know, to work in this setting to do cardiopulmonary exercise testing safely. But there's a real value um, for this population specifically of doing a cardiopulmonary exercise um, test with um, expired gas analysis, blood pressure and you know measurements during exercise as well, ECG, to really get a more robust assessment of how these patients handle stress. And we, we have great data on it. It's just a lot of PT, PTs typically don't do this stateside um, and, I, and I think it's a, a missed opportunity to serve these patients because we can get a much better understanding of, of their clinical status um, and then areas maybe that we can address uh, with rehabilitation. So um, I'll end here and then we'll move on to the rehabilitation management of patients of heart failure.